Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in Torch VR, the one and only at VR escape room in the world. And I just give you a brief introduction into the game. You have chosen Cosmos, which is the game located in space shuttle. You are stuck there and you have uh, like one hour to escape as, as you normally do in regular escape rooms. Today, so the, fir the first and most important part is to work as a team. You cannot finish the game without teamwork and cooperation. That's probably the most important thing about the entire game. You will learn um, skills at the beginning of the game uh, throughout the entire game that you will need to be able to finish the game. At the very beginning, there's a calibration stage and there will be two holograms in front of you. The holograms will look like hands and what you need to do is you need to put your arms all the way out without bending your elbows and match the images. The reason why that is so important is because the computer is calibrating your proportions so that it may superimpose the avatar on you as accurately as possible. So that when you're inside the game everything functions uh, um, the best. Uh, the other uh, important thing is when you get to the flying stage, it's going to be very important for you to um, begin going slowly. You're not a bird and you're not used to flying so the visual information and your vestibular system can disconnect a little bit which can be a bit uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so just start off slowly, see how you feel and moving in straight lines is probably going to be the best there. Um, you have 60 minutes to be able to complete the challenge in this game uh, and the game Cosmos you're trying to escape a uh, space station and uh, remember to work as a team and good luck. All right. AEM and Frank the Crank uh, blog and TV channel. We come all the way from America to uh, Czech Republic in Prague to find the leader in uh, virtual reality. And uh, we find uh, George uh, Tarales mm -hmm. and from Torch Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And he's got many places in uh, Prague here in uh, Czech Republic. And tell us what's so unique about how you've now come up with a new model for uh, incorporating virtual reality, augmented reality, all into escape room technology. So take it away, George. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. Uh, first and foremost, I started um, going out to social centers like bars and other places uh, giving out virtual reality basically for free and asking people how much they would pay for it and what it is that interests them and right away I found out that the most important thing was multiplayer whenever somebody would put on the headset and they would begin playing a game all of their friends in the social environment would be turned off by it they did not like that they wanted to be part of the experience then there was this game that came out and the game um, included a person with a headset doing something and then a person outside having a set of instructions. The person outside reads the instructions, the person inside of the headset uh, finishes the puzzle. And when that happened, when you had interactivity between two individuals, then the entire group and everyone in the social environment became interested. So from very early on, I realized that multiplayer was where I was at and that it needed to be compelling enough. Um, I think that uh, there's a there's quite a bit of expectation around virtual reality. I think a lot of people come into virtual reality or, or come and um, experience it for the first time with us. We've had we're almost exposed over a thousand first unique users to virtual reality, and every time they come in, our mindset um, first and foremost is excellent customer service. We we do not and will never compromise on our, on our customer service level. And then the most important part is to actually be able to fulfill the expectations of virtual reality. I think that um, because of other media like movies, television, and other forms of entertainment, 
um, being at such a high level and being so compelling, when people hear about virtual reality being the next thing, they expect the next thing. And we are doing our very best to deliver that. I don't think that there should be a compromise in those expectations and that when people come to us to experience virtual reality, they, the experience shouldn't start where, when they put on the headset. It should start when they first see us and begin interacting with us and then carry all the way until they take the headset off and they are completely baffled what it is that we're showing them and how it is that we're entertaining them. So from that point of view, um, it's very difficult to execute. There's a lot of technical aspects to it. Um, the business models um, hadn't been developed when we first started, but now um, we're getting a bit of experience behind us and we're beginning to understand what it is that the clients and the consumer wants to see and what works best and also what's comfortable. And you really took me through the programs and uh, what I liked best was that it's a team effort mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I'm probably the worst player on the team, but it made me feel like I'm part of the team, everyone helps you, and I would want to play over and over. Uh, one of the things I didn't like about escape rooms, uh, when I did my research and as we see them, after you play a few times, you have to change the whole thing to make it more interesting. Correct. This, you just keep going and going, and I can see that you're onto something really special. Can you tell us a, a few of the locations around here that people can go see and throughout other places in the world? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, <clears throat> we primarily operate out of the location which we are now, and we will be moving to a new location pretty soon, which you will be able to find out through our website at um, torchvr.cz. And um, the other locations, th there's currently no other locations uh, that offer virtual reality to the same level that, that we do. Um, specifically because we're using uh, advanced kinematics, which is the leap motion sensor, to project the uh, player's hands into the game. Um, I, you know, when, when you show them a clip, we even get some people online telling us that you can't see your hands in the game. They, they send us messages that they say like, oh, why are you lying? You can't see your hands in the game. And you know, we have to message them back saying like, no, indeed you can. I saw all yeah, go, so. come try it out so you, so you can check that out. So there are other locations that are offering virtual reality, but most of them are doing it with controllers. And so we, um, we are, because we see that there's a learning curve with the controllers that um, it would take the player to understand the game and not being able to focus on the visual aspect and the atmosphere of the game that we, we want to remain within the leap motion um, sphere and you know continue to play with, with your hands, which is the most natural way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also like that you didn't, uh, you know, for me, we were in there almost an hour mm -hmm. and the headset was not that heavy, it felt pretty good. Mm -hmm. You could move around, you could do what you want with your hands. And I think this is a great uh, equalizer for people of different ages, for men and women. So uh, you're really onto something. Yeah, thank you. Um, regarding the, um, the, the equalizing aspect of it, initially when we did our market research and we, um, we analyzed the ecosystem, we thought that we were going to have primarily uh, gamers and esports players. And the reason why is esports players is because esports players have the highest interest worldwide in virtual reality. So if somebody's going to um, get virtual reality gear or upgrade their computer, is someone who already has um, the money to or, or the, the resources already invested. So esports players require more powerful computers than the rest of the other gaming scene. So it would be easy for them to upgrade their computer and then get a headset. So we initially thought that we would be able to target them directly and also escape room players. But we've had people here, we, you know, starting at the age of 13, which is the recommended setting, we, we still we stick to the recommended settings for the for the headset but we have people coming here like that are 65 grandmas who are actually able to contribute to the to the team and not only contribute but in some cases like even direct and be the, the lead person uh, it's very interesting to us to sit here because we make sure that uh, when when the people are playing that they're comfortable and that we're there make, ensuring that if they need help with something we we are able to to provide them directions that are clear and accurate as to how to interact with the environment so that they can focus on having fun and so we've had um, 
cases where it's like the family unit and it will be the mother and the father and uh, you know that their three daughters or somebody else the cousin will come with them and I've seen in several cases now where the, the mom the mom, which which is unexpected, I, uh, right? Or, or you would think that it's unexpected, but I, I don't even think that anymore. The mom's the one that led the entire team, that told the team how to cooperate together, how to do the inputs in the game. And you know, we're talking about a video game, and, and she led the entire team, and they actually have a really good score. Um, that's another thing that the competitive aspect for it, it it's, it's also fulfilling for like a different target market. So the our range there, it's, it's really, really, really big. And like you mentioned earlier, not being, not having to recreate physical assets to improve your game because you know the virtual assets we can easily manipulate and create different variables so that um, and every time you play, even if you can play the same game, you would still need to solve either different puzzles or you would need to solve them in a different way. So that also gives it a lot more playability. But in regards to, to our range and our target group, it's it's quite it's everyone basically, everyone with eyes and. Um, a hand can can play our games. It seems to be a, would be a great investment. <clears throat> yeah, it can always be upgraded and, and changed all the time. Can you give me some aspect of of what costs we can see in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So the the most important thing um, to to think about are the the components and also the the tech support for it. I would say. Those are things that are traditionally not part of a entertainment business model. Um, I, I did entertainment for almost 10 years in the United States and California for a company called Party Jump. Uh, they did inflatable bouncy houses and interactive uh, screens and other services. And so the, the main component I see here that would actually make your business model completely different is understanding the computer components, understanding their lifespan, and also understanding when the next technology is going to be available that could potentially make the technology that you purchased obsolete. So your timetable is a lot shorter, you have to work a lot faster. And then on top of that, um, it, it's, it's a tech, it's a, it's a tech business. It's, um, it's, we, we focus very hard on also developing games ourselves and that has helped us understand how the games function, how to make them stable, um, setting up the networks. It's, it, it just requires a, a bit more computer knowledge than, a, than any other entertainment industry has had ever before. There are so many variables to, to consider, to control and to understand. Um, that you need people on your team who understand the technology behind it very well and you need someone on your team who also is looking to the future um, to make sure that your investment is, is being kept safe by not purchasing things that are going to be obsolete in a short period of time. Will there ever be a point where uh, let's say an entertainment facility uh, has one of these and they maybe don't have the, the right uh, staff or the right person to do it can you go into a game from remote and and you know be like a subcontractor for them? Yeah, absolutely. We can we can definitely support um, the games as long as we are giving access to the way they function. We don't necessarily need the the source code, which is the all of the special aspects of the game, but we need access to their network to be able to control it and modify it. The one thing that you always have to have on your team, which is not difficult, we can also train for it, is someone who understands hardware in a in a intermediate, low intermediate range, you know, so being able to refer to the jacks by name, what a USB is, um, understanding what an HDMI is the, the, and how it functions, and HDMI is a head mounted display. So uh, someone who understands the vocabulary when we communicate with them, who can handle the hardware aspect of it will be necessary at location, but anything outside of that uh, network wise we can control remotely and, and support directly. Yeah. I want to ask you also, when we first met, uh, I mentioned that we were partners with uh, Kevin Williams mm -hmm. and the uh, DNA Association. Yeah. Do you, how do you see that developing uh, or how, you know, your interaction with that for the future? Um, so I think that there is a huge opportunity, I th there's a huge opportunity to improve the businesses that are already functioning. And they are so, they're really well connected and their purpose is to distribute and disseminate information that benefits the entire, the entire ecosystem, which I think it's great, which I think it's why we are really interested in, in, in cooperating with them and, and that's why I reached out to them. 
Um, another thing also is uh, protecting um, intellectual property rights is, is really important to us and I think it should be important to everyone because um, if it just it just is when somebody makes a game or when even we make our game ourselves they put so much heart and thought into it it's really like an artistic um, development and it takes tons of hours to be able to do that so having a network that sort of protects that even just by understanding how it works and being able to gather information um, directly from that it's clear and concise is good um, and I also hope that the rest of uh, the arcades and operators and everyone who's in this industry doesn't think about virtual reality as a, as a disruptor to, to their business. It can, it can improve their business. If they, if they embrace it, if they do it correctly, if they have the right people behind it, this is, this is a platform that can make mm, your roller coaster something that it, ha it, it would never be able to be before or your um, walk through theme park with augmented re reality something that is just absolutely stunning and mind-blowing you know I, I picture being able to walk into any of the theme parks or any of the arcades and putting and at the very entrance you put on these hololens glasses and then everywhere you look the the prices and the interfaces and even the menus are just holograms that you interact with right and you can even just order by by making some sort of sign signal and then you know the the the, the customer when um, the people who are doing customer service when they see you they see your name they see who you are they know so it, it can improve massively your customer service level the quality of the experience and we're at a stage right now where the investment into it, it is is safer because the technology since it's not there yet it won't be available to the consumer at least not well developed for a long time so then people want it and they want it now mm -hmm. and they're gonna seek it in whichever way and whoever delivers it um, properly and um, and with with good content and in in a user-friendly way is going to be able to capitalize on it pretty pretty heavily yeah you had also mentioned Jorge about the uh, the age uh, starting at a certain age mm -hmm. is is very good for this. Uh, what was that age? It was so the the head, the HDMI producers, the head-mounted display producers, they say 13 years of age. Um, there are different uh, theories behind why that might be, but generally because um, the games in virtual reality and in augmented reality are going to be more, um, or at least I think they're going to be more cerebral than before, so they, they will require a lot more coordination along with critical thinking skill. And so I don't think that uh, younger children would even be able to perform um, in this kind of games. It would be too overwhelming for them. And then there are other aspects to it that are developmental that could potentially harm um, harm, harm somewhere who, who's young. So putting attention to that as it develops is going to be really important and is something that we're also not never going to co compromise on because, um, you know, to to point one example is for example if you're holding something physical in real life you know it has a specific weight and so if I throw it at you and you catch it you your brain assesses the weight of that right if a younger child spends too much time in virtual reality then his um, brain when it thinks about an object and he's holding the object the object will have no weight and so when he comes back to real life he might his brain might seriously just developmentally not miscalculate the weight and the proportions of things um, and so it, it's going to be very important for the entire industry as a whole to make sure that that is something that does not affect the youth negatively. That would be a huge blow to the industry. That would be um, that would just not be good in any way, shape, or form. And we need, all need to protect each other and our children for for them uh, to to have fun. <laughs> That's very good advice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you see the uh, the future of your company? What, what should, uh, how you can develop the model, the um, financial model? Yeah, so the it, it's it's going to have to be twofold. We're going to have to approach it from an uncompromising level of service so that we so that when people come to us, they understand I'm not going there just because of the content. I'm going there because of the experience and because I want to see what the future is about. And then from the content side, we need to take all of the information that we're gathering from the users and make games that are compelling enough um, to be able to propel us into something higher and higher over time. So we will mix game development 
with the business model and basically run those linearly so that they so that they intersect at certain times and we're able to produce both um, revenues from the content that we produce that we distribute and from the people being attracted to our company and our label and understanding that the level of quality of virtual reality that we bring into the table is higher than anything they could get at home. That, that, that's one of our main goals. I think that's also, um, if you're getting into the virtual reality business, that's something that you should definitely consider is um, offering something that will not be available to the consumer market and that is exclusive and that it's compelling. Okay, well done. Thank you so much for the <laughs> thank information. You. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad we came to Prague. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for going.